K-State Culturally is virtual programming centered on celebrating, uplifting, and educating the Wildcat community through the lens of communities of color connected or affiliated with Kansas State University. Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is K-State Culturally, and this is the Leadership in Color segment um, brought to you by the K-State Alumni Association. Uh, my name is Ceci Ramirez. I am a class of uh, May 2020, so just got out of MHK. Um, I graduated with a dual degree in secondary education, English, and a minor in Spanish translations. And today I am joined by I'm Marilyn Ketch, and I am an alumni in 95 and 97, and I am currently in Roosevelt, Utah, in my office, and I'm so excited to be here. Man, you're in Utah? Yeah, and I, I teach at Utah State University, another land-grant university, and uh, I always like to tell people that K-State prepared me for land-grant teaching, but it, it really prepared prepared me to be a leader among uh, all of the land-grant universities in my early days. So it's a privilege to be with you, Leslie. Oh, thank you. Feel the same way. Um, speaking of being prepared, uh, what challenges at K-State do you feel that you faced um, that probably helped you get to where you are today? Well, first of all, um, I think I want to make sure that people understand my background um, and my tribal affiliation is I'm a member of the Standing Rock Sioux um, Nation, but my tribal affiliation is Hunkpapa Lakota and my home area in South Dakota is the Little Eagle community. But I also am a Kansan. My parents, uh, my adopted family are from Leroy, Kansas, a very small town in Coffee County. And I went to a small high school, very community-based uh, learning environment. And I believe that that prepared me and I wanted to go to a university. And I stayed one year at community college. And as my father and my, my mother wanted, uh, they wanted me to save some money, but also to have a successful uh, segue into higher education. So I learned early on in my freshman year to study, but also manage my time. So I think one of the challenges when I transferred my sophomore year to K-State was to just look for personal growth by managing my time. But when I had opportunities for leadership, then that meant I really needed to stay focused on, on what it is that I'm going to be pursuing in the classroom and making sure that I'm, I'm also becoming a well-rounded student. Um, I, did, I did stay in Smurthwaite Scholarship House uh, and they required community service, involvement, and the challenges that you find when you move from a small you, uh, community uh, like Leroy was, is that you have this very large um, group of, of people that you can meet and get to know. And so I am a person who enjoys meeting people. So that was challenging to stay not too social, but to also stay focused on, on my, my academics and managing my time. Um, I love, I still can't help it, but I like to learn about people. Like we had that great conversation, Leslie, at the very beginning, because I can, I can grow in who I know my connections. So um, as I found the challenge and thank goodness for individuals like Thurman Williams, who is a part of our inceptual group of the Native American student body organization. I think it's a different name, but we began um, to see through our leadership of our, our sponsors, Dr. Harold Prinz, and Dr. Cummings that we needed to have budget. So a challenge our group had was establishing number one, a place to meet, and number two, having budgetary line items to put on things for Native American Heritage Month, which is November, uh, uh, but also to be able to have a, an area that said we want to travel to different places to uh, network with other Native American student groups to also provide a very large part of the spring organization, which was the, the powwow. So it was 
it was challenging to do that. But those are good challenges, I believe. If you can, if you can look at it on the other side, that those are great challenges for leadership growth, because it's not a golden brick road uh, to to leader to becoming a leader. So that was some of the challenges that I I had. Yeah, I I totally understand, especially the the whole I um, trying to find a way to, you know, make sure that your organization um, not only is, you know, being, you know, I guess, heard on campus, uh, but also just trying to make sure that you're growing alongside of your organization is definitely a challenge. And I feel like sometimes, uh, especially for like multicultural students who dedicate a lot of their time to their um, organizations that they're a part of, um, it can be a little bit challenging and trying to make sure that um, you don't dedicate so much of your time that uh, it impacts your academics. And sometimes uh, it does because you care so much about the impact that you know your organization is bringing onto campus. And you wanna make sure that before you graduate, um, you help establish kind of a, a stable structure for you know whoever else is coming next. Um, so I, I definitely understand. Um, and so speaking about like leadership and freshman year, um, I guess, uh, how, how would you, like if you could give yourself some advice or if you could give um, not just yourself, but um, incoming freshman advice, like what is a piece of advice you would give them? Right. Uh, when we talk about the university experience, the university experience means that you, um, you get out of your comfort zone. So the advice I give other people, and I also, I have a niece who's, who's a freshman, um, I gave her advice to, number one, get, get help for academics early on. There are so much support services and academic support services. But not only that, but when you make friends within your content area, sit to the front of the classroom when we go back to the classroom because the higher grade point ever averages are usually in that front first front few rows but um i don't think i told my niece that i gotta go back and tell her that but i i also would give anyone advice and particularly my freshman year self if i could do it all again is, is to meet with my native american student body um my my cohort of friends that I still am very close to them. And when you have close friendships that don't transcend or they are beyond the boundaries, so to speak, of, of your content area, you learn more about the world. So some people, I, I chose to go into um, biology and chemistry. And that mm -hmm. took a few years of changing. I went from psychology and then I went into L ed and then I changed to secondary ed. And I remember that it was, it was, it was important to be able to have that group of people where you could meet over food, um, having a potluck, being able to just ask somebody, Hey, do you want to go for a walk or on your way to class? You've got a friendly face. So those are things just open yourself up to being uncomfortable and learning something. I also wish I would have taken advantage of the study abroad opportunities. Uh, I wish I would have taken more computer science courses, which at the time, I don't know how in depth that was at K-State. And also take a job in your content area that you want to build your skills in. So I probably would have at, tried to become employed in one of the lab research lab jobs on campus. So that's one area. And then I had an incredible academic advisor. And she was wanting me to apply for different scholarships like the Goldwater Scholarship and other scholarships, the Udalls, that were important for building on the next layer after you graduate to build up your resume. So those are things I would, I would highly recommend students keeping that GPA up, but it also, it makes you more well-rounded, you know more people, um, right. um, and the student body gets smaller because you have more friends. Yeah, that, that is for sure uh, very true. I know my freshman year, I kind of was, um, well, I don't want to say I was shy because I, a lot of people will roll their eyes and be like, you shy, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, my freshman year, I was pretty frightened. I mean, 
I was the only one from my graduating class uh, in my high school who who is going to K-State. Um, I had like maybe th two or three people that I actually knew on campus. Um, so I was pretty scared. Uh, and then once I started, like I went to one organization meeting, literally my first organization I went to was LULAC. And after that, I just started meeting like with just one person that you know, if they connect you to someone else, like your network just expands overnight. And um, by the end of my senior year, I want to say I, I had a pretty big network of people and not just not just like students um, or like student leaders, but also um, just administration, uh, like administration and just um, other people that honestly you know, really helped me um, get a lot of opportunities on and off campus. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. I had um, Anita Cortez, who just retired last year. She, she would attend our meetings. She would be involved with mentoring. And as a leader, that's what you do. You mentor back and forth. You are mentored and then you mentor others. And that's also a part of the philosophy and I believe in altruistic as an educator. Um, I was a science educator um, and that you want to help other people. And then it also meshes back with my own philosophy of being a leader. And I, I, I have it interwoven with my own indigenous perspective. And that is about serving and, and volunteering for things that may make you uncomfortable. Um, I'm on the Utah State University's President's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. And being on that, it, it helps me grow as a leader because when you volunteer out of, well, I don't have much time, we, well, you could grow from that. So listening is also a key component of being a leader. And um, as, a, as a native person, I can't help but not just listen more and to also be able to have good conversations when you're listening. So those are, those are areas that I think uh, K-State does an amazing job about bringing up the next group or um, having somebody, uh, I remember she was a part of a different, she was a dean in a different area. She sent me um, a congratulations note on my becoming president of the Native American student body and the success of our powwow. She didn't have to do that, but she was mentoring. And it's about bringing people and saying, I see what you're doing and I really believe in you. And that was, I still remember how powerful that was, especially when you get something that is so unexpected when you're a leader. Yeah, I feel, I feel like being a leader is really about you know, taking that um, that step towards being uncomfortable and, and noticing that maybe everyone around you um, is just as uncomfortable, but you want to make sure you're like, hey, it's okay, guys. Like, it's okay to be uncomfortable sometimes. We, we can grow from this. And I feel like once, um, you know, especially if you're like a president of your organization and you choose to to do that, to take that step forward into an uncomfortable situation, um, all your other members see that and they're like, okay, well, I mean, our, you know, Madam Prez is out here um, putting herself in these situations. I'm pretty sure we can too. So it really is kind of like a, a domino effect, I like to say. Um, so it, I, I do think a leader is someone who, who takes initiative and is also very, I guess I would say, you know, put their money where their mouth is in a sense of, you know, uh, I'm not gonna, going to tell you to do something if I'm not myself, um, you know, going forward with what I'm preaching. Um, speaking of like leaders and stuff, um, who would you say like perhaps could like you would count as like your inspiration or, or any role models that you might have? Right. Oh, that's easy. Uh, my grandparents, um, my grandma and grandpa West and my grandma and grandpa Hetzel. And so my maternal, paternal grandparents and my parents, um, they both sets of, of my grandparents, they worked so hard. And um, my grandpa Hetzel and grandma 
Petzl, or they both um, just showed how being educators and principals, that it requires a lot of after school work and, and really working to build their, your community. My grandma West was also an educator too, but her story, I'll, I'll just I'm so excited to be able to say that's that's my inspiration. Um, Grandma and Grandpa Hetzel both um, really I believe being able to say we put ourselves through college, being able to be the first to be able to have um, an education and putting that emphasis on education was always within the family talk and and it was expected. So then my my Grandma West. And my grandpa Wes both worked so hard to build a very successful farm and family. Oh, and when when you think about what you have to sacrifice to be able to do that, that's a lot of sleep. It's a lot of energy, but it's also you're serving your community. So if people are needing help, maybe they um, have a piece of equipment that they're broke down, but it's helping other people in their times of need. And like Grandma West, she started out teaching in a one-room school room uh, near her, her um, own home as a teenager, and then eventually putting herself through Emporia State's um, normal college and then eventually uh, teaching college and getting a master's degree, but always, always remembering to get home and making sure that she had her bases covered. Covered. Both of my sets of grandparents lived very close to me. So I had so many hours growing up being with them and being instilled in hard work. And if there's a door closed, uh, it, you know, remembering to think about what it is you're doing always with prayer and, and then again, trying to find another opening door. Um, I also found the love of science because of my grandmother's. Uh, both of them encouraged me not to stop reading. So I did a lot of reading as a child when I finally uh, could read. Uh, coming when after I was adopted, I had struggled in school with reading and with math because I hadn't gone to school. So I was behind my peers. Um, but thanks to my mom and my dad and their support, I was able to really work through that. And then having awesome um, aides that were also helping me at school. And so when you think of inspirations, you just, there's so many people that pour into you, timelessness. And my mom and my dad making sure that they're helping me and mentoring me also of seeing, you, know, you can work and have a family, but yeah. you can also be a farmer. You can, can, can give back and, and help other people. So those are my family. I know some people may think of uh, someone else, but I, when I go back to what would they do, or I have pictures of, of my family and I did still inspire me to keep going. It's tiring. Keep going. You can do this. They've overcome a great deal. You can overcome. That's very touching. And I, I can relate to that in the sense of like, I feel like my biggest inspiration is my mom. And mm -hmm. I just think about like, you know, that, that whole, I um, just thinking about how much they sacrifice um, for us. And I remember, I think I read the other day, um, someone was saying, um, how you should think about uh, like when you were growing up, your parents, you know, you get you get paid by the hour. So it, like everything that you ever got, that was that was time. That was time and effort that they put um, to get you to where you are. And I remember I just kind of started tearing up because it just was like, wow, you know, I was I'm the first in my family to, to get a college degree and just seeing just when I handed my my uh, my degrees to my mom you know I had my diplomas and when I handed them to her and she was crying and I was just like you know like I just didn't even know what to say and it was just amazing because I I, I know that no matter like you know 10 years from now I could buy her the most expensive purse the most expensive perfume whatever and I know that it none of it will ever compare to to those degrees that um, that I obtained because she's always told me that's that's why she came to this country was for my brothers and I to get an education. So um, I, I totally understand and I, and I feel like a lot of first generation or not even, but just a lot of leaders of color, like when they think back of all the sacrifices that their families have made 
for them. Um, education is kind of a must. It's a, it's a way for us to just become the first of many, of many to come, you know? I, I, I mean, at least I see it that way. Um, and yeah, it's, it was very, I don't know, it was, it was just a lot of emotions um, going through college, just going through college and, and thinking to yourself, a lot of the time when you're, when, you know, um, you're, you're the only one that looks like you in your class. Oh, yes. Room, or in your major. And you're just like, well, um, do I even belong here? And, mm -hmm. and that I know for sure, like my first week of college, I really thought about that long and hard. And I was like, do I even, do I even belong in, in this institution? Like, do I even, should I even, so I just, it, it is it is a lot to think about um, growing up and, and getting into college. I don't know if if, if you had like, um, you know, just second thoughts about, I mean, you mentioned um, kind of like uh, changing a lot your, uh, your major. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know I, when I first started, I went in for, I was going in for business and the day of orientation, like literally the day of orientation, I changed my major to psychology and education and I remember the people in the front were like <laughs> and I was just like I'm so sorry but I know deep in my heart that business is not what I want to do and after my first semester in psychology I was like this is not what I want either and then I just it wasn't until my senior year that I added the um, English so I was just so it, I feel like college is really a journey and like there's not really one correct path or, or journey yeah that's exactly right and there are so many studies that show you shouldn't come in and have a definitive major until you're in your second year um, and even then some people are saying just continue to you could build on your um, build into your junior year so it's, I, I think it's all about being flexible and you're, you're right that when your mom said, this is, is a, it's huge. And she had the emotional piece. It is, it's about not just, you have the support group in your friends or even in your academic advisor, but you also have it in your family. And some of, sometimes they're not physically there, but they're, praying for you they're helping you they're calling texting to see if you're okay and doing what they know they can do to to support you then that's powerful when you have that yeah i was just saying like um the support that sometimes goes unseen like like your community is really rooting for you i know coming back home from like holidays my mom's friends would be like oh how's college and like um, we're really proud of you and, and we've been hearing like all the good stuff that you're doing and I'm just like okay that adds, it kind of adds on onto the pressure a little bit I feel but it also at the same time it's it's very um it's very rewarding to know that what you're doing is is bringing positivity into your community so I feel I don't know I feel like that that's something that's really nice Would you agree? Do you think, did you feel like you had, just knowing all the stuff that you were doing, do you feel like that brought pressure at all? Like for you to keep keep doing bigger or, or at any point? Well, I think the culture of K-State, of, of just being a part of a larger group of people, of wanting to wanting to better yourself, which in turn betters your community through education. I think that becomes the piece that you just feel the vibration that you want to stay in that vibrational um, stream. And because I was a part of uh, K-State's leadership and, and really getting out of my comfort zone, and I would have even professors would say, you should apply for this. Uh, you should do this. I, I went into the, um, I, I did a summer institute at American University only because somebody said, hey, you should apply with me. And that was a member of the Native American student body. And so I applied, I got it. And I went, whoa, I'm going to be 
taking off to Washington, D.C. And that really blew up my mind of seeing that the world is so large and there's more avenues and then networking even more with other students from around the United States. Then that really builds on that whole piece of when you're a leader, it's about connections. It's not always about being the person in front. It's actually being with other people and connecting with them. So as as you are a leader, the negative piece that many people believe can can see is that someone's in charge. Well, someone does have to take responsibility, but being a leader means you take that humble role. You find out what the talents are of the people you work with, and you can even do that in your classroom when you're a teacher and begin right. to organize your students or organize your organizational um, goals with the talents of the people you work with. And when you work towards the end goal, then you begin to see that your role, which I believe a, a leader really is, is a servant leader. And that allows you to give back to the people you work with. Um, I also believe that when you do mentoring, it's about seeing what people can give you and learning. So it's not a competition. It becomes more uh, synergistic with what we can do to get towards, to make our goals and meet those goals. And leaders, I think they think they've got to become something more. Um, I have a eight-year-old daughter and today she was watching a show where uh, she, she uh, there were no they were, there was a picture of all the presidents and there's no females. And she said, there's no girls, mommy. See, we need a girl president. And then there'll be more girl presidents. And this is my eight-year-old daughter. And I think sometimes you have to step out and take a risk and get uncomfortable. But in your uncomfortability, you learn something. And you, it may mean that you need to do something that oh, you're scared. Oh, I really, I don't know what to do. So you reach out to other people and you can find out from them. So that, that piece, and I think, you know, Dr. Harold Prince, who is our advisor, he was so awesome of listening to us and really remembering. That was another trait that I learned about being a leader. So not being so busy to where you're not listening and remembering uh, what other people have said in their background. Um, and, and I can't say enough, my, my advisor, Dr. Larry Sharman, was a jewel. And going in to talk to him felt like, oh my, I've got, I've got this little bit of time with him, but it's just so full of such affirming pieces. And he would make me laugh, but he was also my science methods teacher and oversaw me student teaching. And he knew me because over time, he's like, come into my office, let's talk or being able to work at um, the diversity and equity um, center that was in, in uh, Bluemont Hall and being able to work with people who are doing um, equity work across the um, regional area and finding out what the research was that was happening. Those were huge pieces of, you've got to get uncomfortable and ask questions. And yeah. uh, in, in Michael Holland, was a huge piece of me being able to go in and be a first year teacher while working on my master's degree. And those opportunities are there because they also are looking for the next group of leaders. Yeah, I think, I think you mentioned some great traits about being a leader, um, making sure that, you know, I think, especially if you're a leader of any sort of organization, taking time to really get to know your members. And I feel like, um, Sometimes uh, I think you made a great point of about us thinking about leaders just as um, someone who takes charge or kind of um, just wants to tell everyone else what to do in a sense. Um, but I feel like the best leaders are those who take their time to help their team develop. And, um, you know, once if you if uh, you succeed at um, making sure that everyone, you know, finds their strengths and their weaknesses, too, because those are important as well. Um, I think you're doing an amazing job as a leader. Um, but what other, um, what traits would you say, or like what negative connotations do you think there are um, in the world about leaders and leadership? Um, there's so many different ways of defining it based upon, um, and so, and as a, as a multicultural lens 
that we have as people of color. Um, people think when you say diversity, the negative con connotation when we say we need a diverse amount of voices that are leaders. They think of them only in terms of race and ethnicity, but when we have a diverse group of leaders or people who are leading, that means there's age, differences in age, uh, differences in experiences, geographical exposure coming from different parts of the world uh, and being able to see economic uh, differences. So diversity, I think is a negative, when they say we want our diverse leader, and they, so they point to the brown person or, hey, we've met our quota. We have an American Indian, we have a Latina, we have, and that's, that's just the, the little bit of it. There's more to it than that. So as, as the negative connotations of, of leadership, um, it can become where you've got, it's prescriptive. So there's models in business we look at, mm -hmm. but there's models models even within our own indigenous ways of thinking, ways of looking at the world. And it's actually, it's a group based where the, the, the voice of reason and the voice of what we do comes from, everybody has a voice. And even as a teacher, I want to know and I would hear like having norms of conversation or the norms in the classroom. It's about there's a respect and a reciprocity that comes back to what we want to accomplish and as a leader that can be you can be looked at as being soft because we need harsh you know we need someone to be able to be cutting or whatever if they have to make a, a firm decision but you can make a firm decision when you have to but you don't have to do it every day nobody wants to work in that uh, legalistic of a of a work environment or even yeah. a classroom for that matter yeah i feel I feel like you brought up some some great points and I feel like you know th thinking about um like you I don't know I don't know if you've ever felt this way but I know that sometimes I would feel like I would get invited places just so I could meet that quota of like oh well here she is here's our brown representation and it's just kind of like okay uh, yeah, I'm Latinx, but I shouldn't be representing every single Latinx because I'm not sharing the same experience. Uh, or just having just one person of color, it means that they're representing every person of color. Um, so uh, I don't know, sometimes I felt like, unfortunately, like, you know, I felt like there were certain opportunities that were kind of given to me. And it was just in the sense of like, let's just, uh, let's just, include you so we can look good um so i don't know if maybe you know throughout your years if you felt that way or if you felt like there were certain positions where you were like hmm i don't feel comfortable here um i'm not really given a voice i'm just here more for a nice look i i think maybe looking back probably i'm sure but when you give me an opportunity and there's something there, I tend to probably speak up. Or I'll ask, now what is the central, what is the central reason? Uh, or even just somebody says, hey, she's an up and coming um, Lat Latinx leader, let's bring her in. Um, it could look like that, but in sometimes when people are wanting to bring in a diverse perspective, they're also, they're going to get a diverse voice. And that means being very vocal. Yeah. So I'm on, as I am on committees or now, uh, as I've been in higher education for so many years, I, I do have a tendency now when you're bringing me to the table that I'm now have a backing and a, an understanding of when it's appropriate to speak up and how to speak up using policy, wanting to see policy change for the benefit of, of diverse voices to be able to feel comfortable to speak. That, that's one way that I know at K-State that they were moving towards that when I was there. And it's a long time ago, don't ask me to date because then you'll, yeah, you'll know my age. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that it's important to do that. So I hope that answered your question.
yeah i feel like i feel like i've become like very more comfortable at being vocal um i still feel like certain times i do catch myself um a little bit just afraid and i notice it's more towards now that i'm kind of like when i go into a professional setting where, where i know that um all the people there have had more years in that area like the experience that i have mm -hmm. um so i know it could be a little bit i don't know a little bit scary when you first graduate and you start moving towards your professional setting and trying to find your voice and at the same time not feeling like you're overstepping uh i don't know i just i'm just trying to like learn how to balance that at the moment um i feel like well, you've also been raised to respect people's, you know, as, as elders, mm -hmm. people that have more wisdom. Right. I remember, I remember that. And I also, now that I'm starting to get into that piece of the older faculty that's been there longer, and I have more um, experiences to look at and as, as a context that it comes. But I also believe that when you are um, of a younger voice that, it's important to come in and open the dialogue up, um, getting to know someone, creating those connections so that you can be able to feel comfortable talking or having a side conversation. Because I've had that happen before uh, where people would say, you need to hear what she has to say. And then that open that up. Not always is that going to be beneficial because we do need to speak up when, when it's important, but in a respectful manner. And that shows that you were raised to be respectful, especially in these Zoom calls. I don't like talking over each other and that becomes very dis disrespectful. Um, and it's hard to do that in, in our Zoom calls. And then I just feel, I like totally agree with the whole, like we were kind of raised for it. it's like, if someone uh, older than you is talking or like, you know, you, you want to show respect, um, but I feel like at a, at like a certain to a certain point, you're kind of just like, okay, I, I'm trying to respect your opinion, but I feel like I have a really good idea and I need to like voice that. So I, I know it is a struggle. So, and then I just had another question. Um, you know, I think we've been talking a lot about, you know, like leadership and becoming involved and things like that. Um, I think right now, like in society, there's just, a lot going on um and i feel like it's very important for you know us to be vocal about um all the issues that are occurring um so just in case like if someone wanted to become a leader or take on leadership roles like what advice would you give them on how to start or um yeah just how would how would you start yeah um at k-state i remember walking through the student union and there would be posters of different organizations. And even in the evening when I would walk through, uh, there would be, an, I would hear music, or I, I remember distinctly one time I heard a drum, but it was a, a different kind of a drum. So I walked in, and I'm in the African, is it African Student Union student group. Yeah, I'm, I'm in there. So I just sat down. Or I would often, with my other um, friends, and I was a part of a sorority, so sometimes I would be walking with them and I would see, and sometimes we just sit down and, and see what's going on in a different meeting. And Thurman Williams and other Native American student body people, we would do that too. We'd, hey, um, they're serving food, which is always really good. So we would uh, join, yeah, we would join in and they would come to ours uh, to also. But, but really getting out of your comfort zone. If you don't know about a certain um, group of people or you are not familiar with events, holidays, tomorrow's Rosh Hashanah. Um, it is a huge Jewish um, celebration. So getting out of your comfort zone means that you look at your own biases and you're, you're looking at your own implicit bias and then getting uncomfortable to really see what other people's worldviews are like. Yeah. Um, looking at the holidays, there's a, there's a reason. There, that must be important to someone. I, I remember Ramadan, uh, one of the members um, of our Native American student body, he, 
he did Ramadan and I thought it was incredible. I mean, we did make fun of him for a little while because he continued to lose so much weight, it, but after, it wasn't about losing the weight. It was about learning about another culture and he did it. He really yeah. wanted to experience it. And that respect then you have for other people, then in turn, being able as a teacher to be able to talk about that, you know about other people's religion, you know about other people's culture. And that al allows for you to see that there doesn't have to be somebody that's always right. Because implicitly, that means if someone is always right, then someone is always wrong. And that's not what diversity is. That's, that's what's happening in our society. I'm right. I'm, I'm right. I'm going to make sure you know you're wrong. And I'm going to, and but that's also not how we're supposed to be as humans. There's nobody's right. Um, and nobody's purely right. And nobody's purely wrong. But we need to advocate also in our schools uh, for, for other people in positions of power that are moving up that they, that we advocate for for that. Um, right. We talked with um, the president um, at the time of our university and really wanting meeting with him, uh, President Weefald, and saying we want a line item for money. In order for us to do anything, we need money. And, and petitioning people in positions of power, and, and Dr. Pat Bosco being a part of that help and really believing in the students. So as we look at the what's going on today, it's not about yelling the loudest or being as disrespectful, um, but we look at how the richness of our own histories, of, of, of even if it's a, even if it's not been an easy history, right? Looking at the history of others, of understanding what happened historically, not not making another group of people or peoples feel bad about a history based upon what happened, but understanding this happened. And it means that we need to be compassionate and be advocates for if there were destructive pieces that happened, being an advocate in your position as a leader to say, we need to take a look at, maybe we need to readjust our calendar. If this is where our meetings are, maybe we need to adjust our meeting schedule because this actually is a high holiday for someone. Or as an indigenous person, I think of it as we have a large world. We need each other. Um, I live in Utah and there are wildfires and all of the smoke that's happening in one part of the state or even what happens in California and on the East Coast that smoke comes to our air and in turn it's going to keep moving so we're connected to each other not only through the environment but we're connected to each other as human beings and as a as a lakota person we don't see it as we're isolated but we're probably related somehow we always know that and you've got to remember that in our in society this is no different than what happened with rodney king when i was in school it was a very scary time on our campus because there were so many presumptions made about it. There wasn't as much media exposure. Uh, we were reading it on, from a newspaper and getting it, our news from the radio and from, mm -hmm. from the TV. So that's where we see that atrocities and inadequacy, inequities happen, but it doesn't mean you have to let it go and let it continue. So what happened even when I was in college it's still continuing today, but now we have records of it and we can now recordings of it. And now we can be able to see, we need to make some changes. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> that was a lot of like good, like good information, not just about, you know, um, just what was, what's going on in the world, but like how history, honestly, I always like to think about just how important to know about history and not just like your own history but just history of everyone because every every piece of the past is still playing a great like part of our present and it's really good to just like kind of give a good prediction of the future um i always like to talk about how i mean you just see like right now with this whole pandemic um 
it's just like there's been other historical pandemics and we're kind of living in a you know we're living in a year that's gonna most likely make it in the history books um, with everything that has been going on um, so I just feel like it's just so important to take time and and you know I feel like one thing that sometimes people are afraid of is to admit that they are um, like wrong or not educated enough on a topic um, I feel like I've learned a lot to just be like hey you know what I, I don't know much about what this community is going through maybe I should start reading a little bit more or maybe I should um, reach out to someone who, who knows more about that issue than you know who better to educate you than someone who's living through through that situation um, and they can give you their their point of view and you know I feel like sometimes people are afraid of that of you know it just all depends on um, how you ask someone you know if someone came up to me and asked me to educate them on you know I don't know like Latinx um, issues or about DACA and undocumented students and things like that you know I'd be more than happy to um, educate you on that topic um, it you know it, it it would make me feel good that I'm helping someone else understand our struggle uh, but I I feel like it I'd prefer that than just someone who's just like, I don't know, um, just doesn't want to, you know, hear us out and, or um, they don't want to give the opportunity to kind of like learn about that community and um, try to see that some of, perhaps some of the ideas that they have about the, the program is not quite what is really going on. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I, I think you've nailed um, several pieces of just talk to me. Yeah. Let's have a dialogue. Right. And it's just more of like, like that, that right there, like, let's have a dialogue. Let's sit down and like, you listen to me, I'll listen to you. And, and, you know, not really of a, I'm trying to tell you something and you're already preparing to argue right back. Like, no, like actually take time and, you know, separate your, your biases and, and just, really have to give yourself that opportunity to experience because that's what you have to do you have to make sure you experience what someone else is saying and not just you know preparing to to um debate yeah it's not a debate it's certainly, no no more time for debate that's for sure Unless it's what we're going to have, uh, which happened right when COVID, when we could go to a restaurant after all those weeks of staying inside. And then we had a debate on what was the best pizza we're going to go or where's our, you know, those are so such, such good things to talk about when you're free. Right. Again. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation. I want to thank you so much for, you know, taking time out of your Friday, it's a Friday, so uh, I wanna thank you so much um, for taking your time. And um, it was really nice to meet you and to connect with you. And I hope that we can stay connected because I really enjoyed talking to you. I think we will be connected and I'd love to see you in person. Um, yeah. I, I have to get back to K-State and also to see my family in Kansas. And I would love it if I could be able to stop in and pop over and see you. And the sound of your birds is wonderful behind you. Thank you. Thank you. I have, I have uh, two birds. So uh, one is Chicha and the other one's Ron. So if you put it together, it's Chicha Ron. <laughs> Little pork rinds. <laughs> so, yeah, here we are. Uh, you know the irony. Yeah. And then downstairs, um, I don't know if you heard, if you guys could hear the barking, but I have three dogs and they're all, um, I have two boys and one girl and they're all siblings. So um, we got, during quarantine, we got dog fever and we were supposed to get one puppy and we came back with three. <laughs> so, you have a full house. I have a, yeah, have a full house of pets. Yes, you do. Thank you, Leslie, for this opportunity. I believe the Multicultural Alumni Council and the association, K-State Association, they're wonderful to support their alumni and their undergraduates. 
and I just thank you for taking time out. Also, it's been a long day for you, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.